So with that, I'll introduce our speaker, Gina Kent. Uh, Gina has worked with Avian Research and Conservation Institute for over 20 years, whether conducting bird surveys from small planes, boating around the Florida Keys, or climbing up 100 foot tall trees, Gina has worked with many Florida specialty birds, including swallowtail kites, crested caracaras, snail kites, reddish egrets, white crowned pigeons, magnificent frigate birds, and others. She grew up in Wisconsin and went to the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Upon graduation, she took tech positions on birds, perps, small mammals, and invasive plants from New Mexico to New York and Missouri to Australia. Wow, that's quite a lot, Gina. Once hired as a temporary tech on um, avian research short-tailed hawk project, she was hooked on the birds and field work in Florida. She received her master's degree at Georgia Southern University on the stopover ecology, habitat associations, and parasites of swallowtail kites. And with that, I'm going to turn the the presentation over to Gina. Thank you, Debbie, for a very nice introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Should do it. Great. Everyone seeing a title slide there? Okay. Well, um, gosh, it was so hard to decide on what to talk about today. Um, Emily Schwartz said, let's do short tail hawks, swallowtail kites, and snail kites. Well, gosh, that is a lot of things to talk about in um, a reasonable amount of time. So uh, I'm just giving you some little tidbits here of awesome information that we've learned um, in our research on these birds. Um, I'd like to um, announce my co-author, Ken Meyer, my boss and the executive director of ARCI. Oh, let's see. Um, we are a nonprofit that is based here in Gainesville. Um, we have uh, our, our niche is to study rare imperiled species and species of concern uh, to um, get information on um, how to make better management decisions for these species. And a lot of what we do is tracking research. So we figure out different ways to um, capture the birds safely and put uh, transmitters on them. And um, we have had many partners in the past. Alachua Audubon Society has been crucial in some of our uh, tracking research, especially recently now with um, tracking snail kites right here um, from Payne's Prairie Preserve. And we do get contracts and small grants through Florida Fish and Wildlife and US Fish and Wildlife but note here that there's a lot of different um, um, bird clubs and Audubon societies and even uh, zoos and, and, and gardens that have supported our work and people just like you. So we, um, we are so grateful for our, our um, sponsors and all these people. If, if you've been in Florida long enough and anywhere for that matter, you do know that habitat destruction is one of the most uh, important uh, conservation uh, impacts on all the species that we are concerned with. Um, this image shows um, how much development is uh, slated for by the year 2060. Um, the red, just if what you can take out of this from this map is that red is bad. So there's fragmentation and um, encroachment on all of the types of habitat that our wildlife needs, which include the three species I'm going to talk about today. So amongst all their trials and tribulations, they, we also have to think of what habitats and what places are going to be left for these species to thrive in. I'll start with short-tailed hawk. Uh, 
um, research, we have um, just a bit of uh, natural history on the short tails. They come in a dark morph and a light morph. So dark, they, there's no integrade, so they are either one or the other. Um, they will mate together, males and females will be either dark or light, um, and uh, a dark and light pair could have dark and light chicks or all dark, all light. Um, so you can identify a short-tailed hawk by this either creamy white uh, breast on the light morph or dark, super chocolatey uh, brown in the dark morph. Younger birds have more speckling um, and, uh, and a little bit of streaking in the neck uh, region for the light morphs. Um, and the dark morphs have these uh, either streaks or, or spots um, across that nice dark uh, chest and inner wing lining. These birds eat mostly, mostly. Um, other birds, small birds. Uh, <laughs> they, um, they hunt from the air and they often use uh, vulture swirls to kind of hide out in and circle up within the vulture kettles and, and then will um, stalk and stoop at their prey from those uh, vulture kettles. Uh, interestingly, we found, um, I've, I've been getting a lot more reports of short tails eating iguana and the um, non-native amiva lizards and even night anoles down in the Miami area while they're there for the winter. So that's the good, um, exotic uh, exotic control mechanism. So why do we care about short-tailed hawks? Well, there are less than 250 pairs of short-tailed hawks all living here in Florida. Um, they are limited. To, the U.S. population is here in Florida, and they are not listed um, with any state or federal protection. So um, these are reasons that we want to keep um, an eye out on these small populations. Uh, just a note here, the picture, it, this is a, a light or a dark morph juvenile and you can see all that, that speckling within the light wing lining. Here is a, a picture of their, um, their range and you can see within Florida, they, um, they are nesting within the Florida Peninsula. And then um, during the winter time, they leave these areas and kind of concentrate in South Florida. So areas mostly south of Lake Okeechobee um, and then into the Florida Keys. They're also found in uh, the stronghold of their population is in um, Mexico, straight through South America. So they, um, they are more abundant in those um, places. And even that Mexico population comes into uh, Arizona, New Mexico, sometimes Texas, but there has been a record or two of, of nesting pairs of short tails within Arizona. But the stronghold of the US population is here in Florida. So we have been researching uh, short-tailed hawks since 1998. Um, our early studies were just trying to learn about nest, nest success and productivity. Where were they breeding? Um, and then what, how did they move throughout the landscape? How did they move throughout Florida? And currently, we're looking more at population monitoring, which um, uh, Alachua Audubon has helped support. And then, of course, all this information is meant to be gathered for uh, recommendations for uh, conservation management. So we have tagged birds on the win wintering areas in the Florida Keys. So as the birds leave their breeding grounds and um, maybe follow the songbird migration uh, down into South Florida. They're, they're eating small birds and, and following 
um, other migratory raptors as they go down into the Florida Keys. Well, we have found some specific spots where uh, short tails pass through and we have caught them um, on these wintering grounds and then put transmitters on them there to then follow them to the breeding grounds in the summertime. So here is a picture of us doing aerial telemetry. You can see the little brackets on the on the wing strut here and the, the antenna cord. So we can um, listen for those individual frequencies that we put on um, from the transmitter. Um, while there, this was down in the Florida Keys, but then again, we uh, the, the main reason for this is to find new breeding and nesting areas in the, in the peninsula of Florida. So uh, birds are carefully um, captured and um, a transmitter is put on the back and they're released right there on site. And then we are able to uh, get the information once they are uh, set free. This is a bird we tagged in collaboration with the St. Petersburg Audubon Society. This is Dark Arrow, and he was tagged in Pinellas County at the Sawgrass Lake Park. And you, if you look at what he did while he was tagged, he spent his entire tracking existence right there in Pinellas County. So he had a hot spot of going over to the mangrove edges in the uh, um, along the uh, uh, the shore here, um, probably eating red winged blackbirds, uh, morning doves uh, roost out there, and of course songbirds, as especially through migration, will use these mangrove edges. But right here in the concentration of all these locations um, is the. Uh, the nesting area. So what was really interesting is that bird stuck to its territory all year. The female um, took off from the area for um, uh, the non-breeding season, but um, you can see that uh, even during um, two summers of tracking, the bird had very similar um, uh, tracking patterns throughout the, the years, um, each year in a row. And just a quick note here, this bird went through Hurricane Irma and uh, spent its time right there in, um, in Pinellas County, uh, right there in Sawgrass Park and, and, and made it. You could see the locations during the night um, that he moved through the perches or through certain areas, probably getting blown um, off course a bit, uh, but, um, but made it through uh, the hurricane. Here's an example of a dot right in the middle of the Chazowitzka National Wildlife Refuge. So this is by Wikiwachi, um, I believe it's Citrus County. And um, so this is on the Gulf Coast and check out that extensive, beautiful forest, right? There's a short tail hawk nest right there. Would we ever see that nest? No. <laughs> so we did an aerial telemetry flight from a bird that we tagged in the Florida Keys and tracked it here, a female on a nest. So here's a picture of that nest. Can you see it? Mm, probably not. Um, so we, we trudged in about two miles on foot to get to the through the swamp and and identify the nest tree and sure enough beautiful um i think it was a bay loblolly bay tree in the middle of this swamp really big fat tree um, where this bird was nesting so Contrary to how we used to get sighting reports of, of where short-tailed hawks were seeming to nest. So this is where people could actually see where the birds were um, uh, because there was access, like there, a roadway, maybe a, a constant pathway where the adults were, were um, passing by and um, birders and wildlife enthusiasts or maybe park um, 
rangers and uh, people working in uh, state and federal parks would give us sightings on where short-tailed hawks were and we would follow up on those and then triangulate to new nest areas. But this way we can um, get a non-biased uh, vision of where short-tailed hawks are nesting, which are sometimes in these vast areas. Who would never have gotten a visual sighting on this so far uh, from human access? So based on that, if you look on the left, we have, uh, oops, uh, these are the birds that were um, tagged with radio tagged. Um, I can't see the top of my slide here. Um, Let's see. Um, so birds that were um, radio tracked. I can't see. <laughs> Sorry, I can't remember what this even says. My thing's covered. It says distance from nest to habitat edge. Thank you, thank you. So birds that were radio tagged were much farther, their nests were much farther from habitat edge. So um, these extensive forests were bigger, basically, um, or farther from people um, than uh, birds that were uh, nests that were uh, um, located by sight. So, and uh, it's quite a significant um, uh, detection here. And similarly, these are, um, this yeah, tell me what this is, Mike. Urbanization within 10 kilometers of nest sites. Yeah, so similarly, uh, much less urbanization within the nests that were found uh, just by uh, from radio tracked birds versus nests found from sighting reports, which makes sense because people are within urbanized areas or places they can access. So um, they're probably closer to um, these urbanized areas, uh, the, the people and the birds. So this just um, kind of makes a, um, a good point that we have, the, that the short-tailed hawks are really um, uh, choosing uh, these places that are quite remote, at least um, this, this sample size. So back to uh, tracking their populations over time. We have developed um, these fall road surveys. So in um, you, uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife supported us to figure out the best way to track the, um, the population over time. Basically get a snapshot of where short-tailed hawks were in the winter. So we know that during the months of October through December, the majority, the, the highest peak of short-tailed hawks are in the Everglades and the Florida Keys. So we did boat surveys, road surveys, and helicopter surveys, um, trying to figure out what kind of routes we could do, what kind of survey protocols we could do that were most cost effective to, to uh, look at these birds over time. So um, obviously, well, um, we came up that came out that the road surveys were the most um, economical, and they could be done by qualified uh, citizen scientists and. Um, We've had uh, support from uh, Alachua Audubon helping us out with these surveys um, that went through the Everglades and all the way down the Florida Keys. So these are spots along the way. We, we have um, a series of locations that we stop for seven minutes and just scan the sky and look for um, any short-tailed hawks and uh, try to identify um, if they're light morph or dark morph and, um, and if we can get an age on them, that's good too. But uh, we do this, we try to do it three times per season and, and then we can kind of uh, see where the peak of um, 
the bulk of the short tail hawks are within in South Florida. And then that's just kind of, um, you know, it's not accounting for all short tail hawks in Florida. It's just a uh, something we can look at over time as a, uh, a snapshot of uh, what the birds are doing within the keys or along these routes um, year to year. And you may recognize some folks here. We have Debbie Siegel and Gigi Del Pizio, who were wonderful volunteers uh, the last two years um, and uh, helped out tremendously. So um, this is something that if you are interested in the future, maybe you could uh, come along on some of these uh, raptor or short tail hawk road surveys. So keep that in mind for next October, November, December. Um, in the breeding season, the short-tailed hawks and swallowtail kites often share the same airspace. Um, we've had, uh, I knew of a swallowtail kite nests in a cypress tree that the second year, um, the short-tailed hawks moved into their nest. <laughs> So before the kites got back, the short tail's like, yep, yeah, that's that's a good nest. I'm going to use that. So they, of course, add their own sticks. And um, but uh, since they are a little bit more powerful, a little more cranky, uh, the short the swallowtail kite had to find a new um, nesting area, which which they did no problem. But with that, I am going to move on to swallowtail kites. Uh, species ARCI has been doing research on since uh, the early or late 80s. So uh, we've been doing tracking uh, surveys and tracking studies on these birds since 1996, uh, learning about the migration all the way to South America. So the swallowtail kite used to nest up into Minnesota and Wisconsin, um, portions of 21 different states, essentially, along these big river systems, the Mississippi, and then, um, you know, a big push in uh, the logging industry, cut down many of the uh, mature trees, and um, so the swallowtail kites uh, distribution definitely dwindled after the 1940s. And currently, uh, they are nesting within portions of uh, the seven um, southeastern states. So around the Gulf of Mexico. And now, more recently, uh, they've been finding nesting pairs in just over the border of South Carolina into North Carolina. So that's that's good news. They are more likely to colonize um, kind of bud off of where they're existing instead of create a whole new colony um, far from where they are uh, currently nesting. So when swallowtail kites are in the US, they are um, here to breed, here to make babies. So they get to their uh, nest, territory and they start courting and building nests as soon as possible. They put a lot of Spanish moss within their nests. Um, they choose the highest trees, um, kind of what we call super emergent, um, above the canopy. So they can get in and out of their nests quite easily. So if you think of um, how graceful a swallowtail kite is. They really need uh, a runway, essentially, to get in and out to those chicks or eggs um, in the tops of the trees. So here you can see it's they're nesting in a pine tree, which is quite typical for, um, for Florida, but they'll be in cypress trees, they'll be in maple, oak. Um, just the, the crotch in the canopy of the tree has to be high enough and open enough for those birds to get in and out. But check out all of that Spanish moss. And then uh, you can see there's some old man's beard lichen. They use a lot of that for um, kind of the icing on the cake, but <laughs> I say icing and then I look at this picture, which 
a little time out here. Uh, a big, huge thanks to all of my photographers um, that have donated great pictures to me. Max Stone, if you don't know his work, a wonderful Florida conservation photographer. Um, look up his work. We've done a lot of um, swallowtail kite projects together. Um, fantastic photos. Anyways, um, you can see all the poop along the edge of this nest. So if you think of um, an osprey, even red shoulders or red tails, when they poop, they like scoot it out like it just goes off and far from the nest. Well, not swallowtail kites. It just blops over the edge. So the adults keep adding more and more vegetation. Um, uh, well, more and more moss into the nest, which makes the once a bowl of a nest into more of a platform. And this can get risky for those little chicks hanging on um, if there's a big windstorm and they're at the tops of these big trees, sometimes they fall out. Um, so it's, it's a little uh, tricky for them to be up there too. It can be dangerous, especially with late uh late spring storms we have recently done this uh bird conservation in working forests project uh we collaborate with the sustainable forestry initiative um, american bird conservancy and international paper amongst many other um working forest companies and the case is that swallowtail kites are nesting in a lot of these industrial forests. You know, the, the, um, the, the harvest pattern mimics uh, this mosaic uh, forest that they, they do well in, where there's um, areas that have, so when they do thinnings of the pine trees, often those, those, tree rows that are closest to the cut will um, pop up, like grow higher and be those super emergent um, nest trees that um, the, the birds are searching for. And then um, this, like uh, the forest edge, it also makes a great place for the birds to um, search uh, aerially for um, anoles and tree frogs and snakes and even little baby birds um, that they can glean from the, the treetops to feed their young. So um, we've been working with these uh, forest companies to uh, just figure out the best way to keep the forests going and making sure there are mature enough trees left at um, a certain point in each year that the kites can then nest in. Um, so, you know, they do these habitat or these um, uh, timber rotations, but they can also um, buffer certain areas or, you know, leave behind just a, a maybe a chunk of pine trees that are close to uh, a waterway or a swamp that can then be left to um, mature into potential uh, nesting trees for the kites. And this is uh, very um, going over very well with with these timber companies. So back to tracking. Um, our, a lot of the, the studies we've been doing have involved remote tracking of swallowtail kites. So here is a swallowtail kite with a solar powered satellite transmitter. And with this information, um, especially now, um, we have been trying to locate places like this. These are communal pre-migration roost sites. So at the end of a breeding season, all the swallowtail kites will go to these known roost sites. They are places where information is shared. Information is passed on knowledge of safe places to rest and replenish their fat reserves and also to gain fat reserves for the big migration ahead. 
So they are following each other to uh, foraging areas. And um, so by coming together, you know, all more eyes on um, any potential predator issues. So they, you know, the safety in numbers for sleeping, but then during the day, they can go and do what they need to do. And that is find food, find bugs, find those ephemeral groups of flying insects. Um, they are, uh, the adults are, and, and then the young, once they're on the wing, are like so dependent on insects for food. They are almost exclusively insect eaters. They want to be flying and, and not spend their time um, landing and eating something big. So they are chowing down on any kind of insect possible. And if you were fortunate enough this past year, we had a super phenomenon just outside of Gainesville to the, to the west, um, some of these watermelon fields that were uh, full of rotting watermelon and then um, hence a bunch of insects that were feeding on the dead, uh, dying, rotting watermelon and um, hundreds literally I think I counted a maximum of 350 or 400 swallowtail kites silently feeding over these ephemeral insect swarms over the uh, um, melon fields. So they need to get into these big foraging aggregations and using these communal roost sites, which we find um, with our, our remote telemetry um, because we have the ability to get um, a latitude and longitude and a time stamp of where the birds are at night. So we can concentrate and say, wow, we've had three different birds spend the night here. Or if one bird continually uses the place over and over, we might go check that out. So we have developed a population monitoring uh, mechanism at these pre-migration uh, pre communal roosts. So this has been going on for quite a while. And at the end of uh, July of each year, we get up into planes and early in the morning before the kites get up. Uh, the nice thing about raptor work is they are lazy. They want to wait till those thermals start. Uh, in the daytime, so um, before they start flying, because it's just easier. They don't have to flap as much. You know, they're still preening. They might be wet from dew or an evening storm. So they um, they start uh, waiting till the air warms up, which is still early enough, like eight thirty or nine. But it does allow for an hour or two of flight time to get to these communal roosts and then take pictures while they're all sitting and relaxed and then count all those birds from the pictures. So we know of 12 of these places we try to get to every three days in the last two weeks of July, early August. So, and then we combine all these uh, pictures and then we can get a really great snapshot of the population of swallowtail kites because we are not just seeing birds from Florida. We're, we're getting birds from South Carolina, even Louisiana, all, the, all throughout uh, the, the range. They are coming through, many of them come through Florida and many will spend time at least at one of these roosts. Some birds might spend a month every single night at, at these roosts. Some birds, might visit two or three or five of these roosts just bouncing around. So a bird in South Florida doesn't just hang out in South Florida after nesting. It We have birds from South, like uh, the Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge that went to essentially the North Carolina border uh, for its pre-migration and uh, spent a month up there and then came through Florida and each one of its stops within Florida was in one of these known migratory roosts or pre-migratory roosts. And these were all found by the use of our 
uh, remote tracking, which thanks again, Alachua Audubon for helping uh, us help the birds and finding these places. Swallowtail kites are, are at these roost sites to get ready for this perilous portion of their migration. So once they leave Florida, they're ready to cross the ocean. They have to get from the pen peninsula to ideally the Yucatan uh, Peninsula, and then everything's over land from there. So they're doing this at the start of hurricane season, which can be very treacherous. And this year we had some very, very strange winds that pushed uh, birds far to the west, all the way to um, the to uh, the western part of um, the Gulf. Instead of to the Yucatan Peninsula, they continued to uh, like Veracruz or even farther north, and then went into Texas. So we had just weird weather systems. Uh, these birds are completely creatures of the wind. They don't flap. If you think of a peregrine falcon or an eagle, they, they're power flight. They flap hard. They are working to migrate or to move. And swallowtail kites will just set their wings and glide. So they really have to uh, pay attention to uh, the tailwinds. And they can't fight it because it's just going to wear them down. So... Um, this section of their migration is very uh, perilous coming, going south as a, an equally um, or even more so coming back to the breeding season, um, leaving from the Yucatan and then back uh, to portions of their, um, their nesting habitat uh, in the US. This is what the typical um, migration patterns look like. This is uh, seven or eight birds. Each color represents a different GPS tracked bird that we have followed. Uh, this is all southbound migration. Uh, you can see many of the birds do live, leave off of um, the tip of the uh, Florida, kind of um, Marco Island and South. They cross the Keys. Some of them spend time on Cuba, but um, often once they get to the Yucatan, which again, there, that's the goal and everything's over land after that. Once they get to the Yucatan, they um, often have a proper stopover. So they rest and replenish their fat reserves sometimes hanging out um, for a week or so before continuing south. And um, then they get down to portions of Brazil. Uh, right now, um, many of our the birds we're tracking uh, go to Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso do Sul, and also Rondonia, um, so the southwestern portion of Brazil. We've also had birds in Paraguay and Bolivia some birds kind of book down and get to uh, one location where they'll spend months. Others really take their time. Um, the southbound migrate really take their time and don't spend more than a few weeks in an area and then and go pretty far south, but then start north much quicker. So birds going south are, are going slower. Um, taking their time, um, often on the onset of the rainy season as insects um, are hatching, um, they will take their time getting through the Amazon uh, where there's a lot of uh, food sources. They'll um, take advantage of that as they're going south. And then once they turn north, which happens in the last two weeks of January um, and early February, they'll start north again. Uh, they go fast. They are on a beeline to get back to those breeding areas. So uh, breaking news, here are the birds we are tracking currently. And five of them have started their migration. So um, 
we will be we post um blog updates we're going to try to do this weekly on our website um, and it'll have descriptions and background stories on all these birds that we are tracking and um so we have five different colors here and 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 now as this bird for instance the white one is now in the middle of a cell phone free zone. <laughs> and most of these birds are giving data through cell phone technology. So if there's no cell phone towers, we're not gonna get an upload of the data. So still collecting all those locations. And once it gets into cell service, it will dump those locations, but we just have to cross our fingers that the birds are getting through the Amazon safely. And um, one thing that's been troubling in the last couple of years, there's been so many more fires uh, within the Amazon. So these are places the birds pass through. They've got to they've got to eat. They've got to rest in these places, but it's not really where they spend the winter. So they've always gone through quite quickly, but still they need need to be able to get the the uh the resources they need uh so because we've been tracking birds since 1996 we have such a great wealth of data to to look back at over time so that's something we're excited about but do uh keep track of our birds with us on our website we'll also make facebook posts um, to let you know when when we have a updated blog. To learn more about our kite, um, kind of the nesting, um, uh, nesting studies we've done, um, and more of Max Stone's beautiful photos. Uh, check out this dual article. the The text is the same in both of them, but the photos are going to be different. Uh, so Biographic um, is just a wonderful um, online resource. And then Audubon, if you look up um, Perilous, oh, sorry, Perilous Perch is in uh, Biograph, Biogeographic. And in Audubon, it's the secret lives of swallowtail kites. So I hope you take a look at that. Moving on to our stars here of Payne's Prairie, the snail kite. So they are listed as a, um, an endangered species by state and federal criteria. So they are also a species only found within Florida. However, they do have um, other, uh, there are more snail kites throughout the world. Um, and I'll show you a, a range map in just a bit. Uh, but some of their issues are that they have such a specialized diet. So um, eating snails, although they will also eat um, some crayfish and some small turtles. I've seen them with baby turtles just like pulling out the meat like it was a apple snail. <laughs> and uh, because their, their diet of snails is so tied to the hydrology, so how high the water levels are and wh what is wet at what time. And then with any water system, you have to worry about water quality. So these are things um, against the swall or the snail kite. Um, you probably have heard about these giant um, invasive apple snails. Um, snail kites are able to eat them, takes them a little bit more time, but uh, they are inundating Florida waters. So they are bringing snail kites to new and exotic places as well. Um, the, the native snail um, is, is also a... Um, sought after food source, but the exotic snails are much more abundant um, than their native counterpart at this point. The, if, if you've been in Florida um, long enough, you may have seen a similar schematic like this. The system of water flow through Florida was from the areas um, as far north as the Kissimmee River through 
Lake Okeechobee and then out through the Everglades, all this water free flowing through the peninsula. Well, then that got channelized by the Army Corps of Engineers. So all of much of this was um, put into um, canals and, and channelized rivers. And now a lot of the water is leaving through the Caloosahatchee River and then out through um, the uh, out into Indian River um, Lagoon as well. And so that natural flow of water is not going through the Everglades as it used to. And uh, uh, it's, and water then is here is, is taken up into agriculture. So there is a lot of movement and a lot of uh, uh, things that have already started happening to recreate, rehydrate the Everglades and make that water go through the peninsula once again, um, more naturally, de-channelizing and, and allowing for this sheet flow effect of water to reach um, the Florida Bay once again. And this can only help snail kites and other species because it will restore the hydrology for their food source, the apple snail. So historically, the snail kite is called the Everglades snail kite because that was the stronghold. Well, they're not in the Everglades anymore. They have really moved into these other um, waterways and, and wetland systems. So we've been doing uh, tracking studies of adult snail kites since 2006, 2007. And we have used satellite telemetry as well as now the GSM cell phone telemetry to follow these birds throughout their, um, their uh, movement patterns um, and, and, and finding where what waterways, what wetlands they are using and how long they're spending time in each of these places. So snail kites historically, um, you can see that uh, they do live in, um, in Cuba and the Yucatan Peninsula and um, much of South America, which I didn't even include here. But within the United States, and as far as we've seen with our tracking data, there is no um, disperse, dispersal or intermingling with the Cuban population yet, um, as, as seen by uh, telemetry. Um, but, and, and as we've known um, all the way through 2017, snail kites nesting um, locations were as far north as Lake Tohopec Liga, which is in, um, in Kissimmee, which is just south of Orlando. But Hurricane Irma and many exotic snails later, um, we know that the snail kites have moved into Payne's Prairie, which is very exciting. And it has made Paynes Prairie Preserve State Park here in Gainesville, Florida, one of the most important nesting locations for snail kites in the last couple of years. And it, it happened so very fast. So with support from Alachua Audubon and St. Petersburg Audubon, we were able to track snail kites right here in our backyard. So you see the dots, the locations um, in three different colors. Uh, we tagged two females, which is the pink and red locations and uh, a male, which is the, the blue locations. The females were tagged just a year ago and still doing great. And the male was tagged in May and um, also great. Um, but I wanna show you specifically what they've been doing. Um, uh, just to orient you, you can see Sweetwater Wetlands, everybody's favorite little uh, birding wetland park up here. And then this is Highway 441 going through. There's a wonderful 
um, observation deck here and lots of snail kites use uh, using the road e or the area each side of um, of Highway 441. And then um, I-75 is um, runs parallel here. Um, you can see this concentration of locations. This is a roost site. So many of our, well, we have, all three of the birds have gone to this roost site on the west side of Highway 441. And then they um, cross over to um, uh, back over uh, 441 to feed during the day. So a little nervous that they'd make this move because uh, they're crossing a highway and many power lines as well. Um, we do know and have found one carcass of a, a snail kite, not, not one of our tag birds, but just happened to see a dead bird on the road. Um, so do pay attention um, if you do see a bird carcass, um, maybe, and you have a safe time to pull over and, 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 and check it out. Um, there, there are other um, birds out there that we're not tracking, but uh, the UF, uh, USGS monitoring crew are banding chicks. And um, there's a lot of banded birds out there. So um, that, that would be a, a information point to know if, if there are um, marked birds that might be getting hit. But I, I wanna show you um, specifically what each of these birds have been doing. So Payne's Prairie number one. Um, this, ooh, oh, whoa, 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 here we go, sorry. <laughs> um, check it out, okay. Can you, oops, let's see. My first was doing something. Okay, so she spent a lot of time here, and then in May, did this big loop down to Lake Okeechobee, um, checking out some areas here in Highlands County. Look at, she went uh, by um, Kissimmee, Lake Toho, around East, um, Apopka, and then straight back to where she was. And this trip took about five, four or five days. So it wasn't very long, but that's a lot of mileage just on a whim, right? To check out probably her own haunts. This bird was an adult one and we tagged it. So it most likely did not grow up in uh, Payne's Prairie. Right now, the bird is still in Payne's Prairie and uh, makes very frequent trips down to Orange Lake almost daily. So doing some prospecting over there. Payne's Prairie number two, a uh, female made a move in May away from uh, Payne's Prairie as well, uh, like within two days of the other bird, uh, other female, and um, spent a little time down in, um, my cursor's gone, okay. Um, down in Highlands County, just on the north side of, or the northwest side of Lake Okeechobee. And that is where she has been ever since. So the kind of big foraging or the forays, um, north and south, she did within um, a couple of weeks of each other and then settled into a spot in on private property in Highlands County, and she remains there now. The male, um, I can't remember when he left Payne's Prairie, but uh, made his moves to the south uh, with these big kind of loop around um, the western shore of Lake Okeechobee, and then back into Citrus County for whatever reason, <laughs> skirting around Tampa, and then back to Lake Okeechobee where he remains um, in uh, Moonshine Bay on the Western edge. Also, um, uh, this is an adult male. So seeing all of those birds together and then I, I made pins for where those birds are today. So um, we've got one of our birds still hanging out on Payne's Prairie and to our, our farther south, um, just uh, in Lake 
Okeechobee area and, and just north into Highlands County. So these maps will be added to the database of other birds we've tracked since 2007. And we are interested in how these birds have crossed um, through previously con um, habitats that were considered unsuitable. Um, so these are exotic apple snails, and uh, this is a this is a water control structure over a canal that is just filled with these snails. And obviously, snail kites are sitting there and eating um, as many snails as possible right there. So it's not what you would consider snail kite habitat. So these canals are, you know, crisscrossing South Florida and into neighborhoods um, that really have no other wetlands. I mean, they are providing a food source, but we need to make sure there is still places around for them to be able to nest. So of our locations in the, in the past, they, we had more than half of them were outside traditional nesting areas and nest, um, traditional survey areas for the snail kite. So, you know, they're, they're being, um, they're outside the places where like managers and people are, are actually paying attention and might have jurisdiction of, of protecting an area. So they're in these you know, they're on private property. And like I said, in these, in these random canals. Um, so it really is, is kind of, a, it's a management problem where they're like in these places where um, they, they are not, um, we're not able to, to get as much control over protection. So something to keep track of. So they make these long distance movements, which we've seen over time. And often a lot of those movements are very direct. Like, like we saw with the Payne's Prairie Birds got right to Lake Okeechobee, passing through all of those historically known um, breeding areas and, and, and wetland systems where snail kites have been in the past. So it's like they have this map of where good habitat is. And then the other part of that equation is that they might be making some previously unknown movements to help them cope with the unpredictable hydrology. So as water levels ebb and flow throughout these various wetlands where um, snail kites nest, um, if, if one gets low, um, where snail kites are, then they know, okay, these other places that I've flown across in the past might have more water. So then they can move to those places when needed, when their snail levels deteriorate and um, foraging becomes um, more difficult, they make those moves uh, to, to better places. So Basically, snail kites need a network of wetlands to sustain their population, wetlands where they can breed. So in any given year, at least some portion of those wetlands must be able to support successful nesting, which uh, a good case in point is Payne's Prairie. It, it came online. It's, it was a fantastic place for um, nesting uh, nesting opportunity for snail kites in the last two years uh, especially but now the water level is dropping we've got two two birds that have left the area and at this time last year were there so they did not return so in the places they are now are they um, they're obviously feeding well and and staying and that's why they haven't come back but you know, once they get into um, breeding mode, are they going to stay there where the, the food is good and um, perhaps the nesting is okay? Or would they make their way back to Payne's Prairie? And by the time they get here, is, is the water level and the, the amount of vegetation 
um, covering the area, um, going to be supportive of uh, enough food and enough nesting um, places for the kites. So uh, it's, it's really interesting to um, keep getting this information and, and following the birds when we, when we are able to. And, and we'll be able to learn because uh, we've got these little trackers on them and we can see where they're deciding to settle. So um, just a few closing slides. Um, what can you do to help us help the birds? Um, I invite you to check out our website and our Facebook page. Um, we are interested in your sightings. So uh, we have a new website um, coming online here. It's a little bit under construction, but um, if you, uh, you can report your sightings in the Get Involved tab. And then we are um, interested in uh, any swallowtail kite nest observation sightings. So you might think um, you've got behavior of kites that seem like they're getting ready to nest in a certain area. And we invite you to um, check out our, our Eyes on Kites initiative, which um, is a, a nest tracking program for kites. And um, we're still in the development phase of that, getting that into our, our website, but uh, it will be up within the next few weeks and ready to go. So here's what our our website looks like. And if you see this get involved tab, um, you'll be able to bring that down and see uh, report sightings. And that's also where we'll have the eyes on kites access. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, wow, I've talked a long time, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that, that was excellent. But like I said, I have so much information. <laughs> yeah, I think we could. We should have. We should have split it up right. into three talks and and fill the fill the schedule because that yeah, was yeah, I know lots of information. Cool. All right, we do have some questions here for you. I guess we'll we'll take them in order they came in, and uh, so you're gonna have to switch your mind from all the different species. But uh, we'll back up to I'm short ready. tail hawks. Okay. Um, Carl Miller asks, how many short tail hawks currently have transmitters? How many? Zero. So how are you, um, I mean, no, how do you zero. basically get a sense of where they are? <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, right now, um, our, the only thing we've been doing is the, uh, the winter or fall road surveys. So then that's all observational, yeah. Sounds like, uh, sounds like you need to get some transmitters on those birds. Yeah, we'd love to do more for sure. Uh, Chloe Arbogas asked a question. Is there any reason short-tailed hawks have two morphs? Are there any advantage to having two morphs? Hi. Gosh, I don't know the answer to that. That's pretty cool. Um, what would be an advantage? Gosh, that's a very good question. I'm sorry, yeah. I don't I know we see that in other raptors too. So there's, you think there must be, yeah. must be some driving force. Yeah, and then I think of herons like reddish egrets that have a dark and a light morph. Um, I don't know what advantage would it be or, um, or why, you know, it's a genetic thing and I'm not a, I'm, I'm not good with uh, genetics. So <laughs> I'm right, sorry, Chloe, I don't have a good answer. Own research on that one. Uh, Carl Miller has another question, and then we're now we're moved on to swallowtail kites. Uh, is each roost surveyed once or multiple times, or are they all surveyed in the same day? We try to get to as many of them in the same day and then repeat that all three days later. So they're re they're, we try to get to them multiple times um, and, and try to try to uh, survey at least the big ones at the same time so we don't you know over overlap any of our counts and heather levy asks do you foresee snail kites continuing to venture northward and anecdotally it seems that there have been more and more sightings north of their strongholds 
Yeah, they're such good flyers, you know, they're big, like a big parachute. <laughs> and I feel like, um, especially because Payne's Prairie wasn't just like a, a one hit wonder, like two, four, six nests, it was, you know, 70 or more, um, that there was a lot of birds that were raised here. And you know, they, they're ready to prospect and, and look for new places. So I'm, I'm excited and I hope, uh, and it, it's probably good for them to have more wetlands to be able to um, find for nesting. So we hope to keep watching them now that we're uh, tracking them. They sure moved in here quickly. So that was exciting. Yeah. Uh, Tim Harden, and this is a question to when you were showing the, the travel pass of the three different birds. Uh, he was asking which month was uh, bird number one's trip? May. Both the females left in May. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, what's the, the general current snail kite population in Latchewa County or Payne's Prairie? Ooh, right now, currently? Um, that would be a question for the monitoring crew. <laughs> which is uh, the USGS slash UF crew. I think, I think they're doing monthly surveys. I just know about the three birds that I track. Yeah, I, I, I had the, the Christmas bird count numbers, but I, I've, I've forgotten them, so. Uh, yeah, they were Christmas quite high. To chime in. Yeah. Uh, Chloe asked another question. Uh, has climate change affected some of the birds' ranges? Yeah, that's definitely information we want to keep track on and 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 monitor um, as sea level rises. Um, you know, some of the uh, peripheral wetlands um, on the coasts. Uh, I, I think of for short tail hawks and and swallowtail kites as well. Um, they will get inundated maybe with salt water, and so providing less. Uh, less of the nesting areas. I'm thinking of a, like up in the big bend area uh, where both swallowtail kites and shorttail hawks nest. Um, but uh, it is something we wanna keep, keep track of. Um, and Chloe has another follow-up question. Are there any patterns between the swallowtail kites roost sites? Uh, are they well distributed or are there? Yeah, you know, actually they, they most of them like to be by water, um, like remote rivers or um, uh, lake edges, uh, but most of it's like um, by water. So it's, they're distributed kind of in weird, weird places, but um, like the St. John's River um, kind of corridor has a few um, and then, yeah, other uh, little creeks and rivers uh, throughout Florida, but they're, there's not, uh, they're very unevenly distributed throughout the state. So you couldn't predict it if you want, you wanted to try and guess where one might be. You know, be. it'd be interesting to do a little bit of a habitat uh, more micro habitat analysis of each of these places. Um, to see if we could maybe find a signature to look for more, but really the, the use of the telemetry data is, is so beneficial for us in that matter that they're so social that they find each other and they tell us where they are. <laughs> Very handy. Um, and one last question from Heather uh, Levy again. Do you incorporate any eBird data into your research? Yes, I look at eBird quite a bit. Um, you know, we have our own sighting report form for the species we study, but um, yeah, I uh, often often eBird doesn't have the specific information I want. So if it's a, a nest location and things like that, or or more information on the behavior, so that's the kind of uh, questions that I have um, within our our citing reports um, form to to get at that those answers to say, hmm, those, those birds seem like they might be nesting in those areas. And then I'll use, I'll look at eBird, uh, like if, 
you know, I can um, download recent reports of, of various species to, to find out where to, to look for nest areas or um, trapping or foraging sites. Uh, so uh, eBird is, is very um, important resource. And so thank you everyone for being a user and sharing all that information because it does go a long way to, uh, to researchers that are mining that data. A couple of people, no more questions, but a couple of people have chimed in to point out there were 89 snail kites on the last Christmas bird count. Ah, I remember two awesome. or three years ago, uh, there was like 29 and we were all very excited about 29. So that's a big jump in just a couple of years. All right, well, that's it for the questions. That's cool. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Thank you very uh, much. Well, I hope the next time we do this, we can do it in person. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I encourage you, if you guys have any more questions down the line on any of these species or any of our work, please don't hesitate to get in touch.